mother, do you think they'll drop the bomb? Mother, do you think they'll like this song? Mother, do you think they'll try to break my balls? Paper Mario is a spin-off RPG series based on taking the beloved mustachioed plumber and cutting corners on character models. On a scale from Super Mario RPG to Mario & Luigi, it falls a bit more on the right in terms of Mario RPGs neglected by Nintendo, which isn't a huge scale really, but it's surprising that there's three games that I can categorize under that title. But we'll get to that later. The series is a beloved franchise by many. Well, kind of. You see, Paper Mario is a lot like Star Wars. The first one is revolutionary, carrying a certain charm that gets people hooked. The second one is widely regarded as the best, expanding on everything that made the first one good and bringing in loads of new stuff. The third is a little weaker, the weakest of the original three many may say, but it still has our beloved characters and, although the new stuff isn't as engaging as the stuff before it, it's a worthy member of the original trilogy nonetheless. And then everything after that is SHIT! But why? Why has it been a decade since we've had a good Paper Mario? What made it good in the first place? What made it stand out? Well, that's my job today. I'll show you just what the magic of the originals were before they started to shove new gimmicks down our throats. The first game in the series actually began as a sequel of sorts to Super Mario RPG, so I guess that scale familiar only has two series on it if you want to be technical. However, blah, legal stuff, blah, blah, Gino will never be in Smash, blah, and bada bing bada boom, it's Paper Mario instead. Aside from being a Mario RPG with funny writing, the game definitely differs from Super Mario RPG, and the absence of Square Enix is obvious, although I think that's a bonus for the game. Rather than characters and enemies feeling sort of alien from the rest of the Mario canon, all the characters of this game are pulled from all sorts of Mario titles, and even the new ones feel right at home with the beloved Mario cast, never straying too far in terms of design or tone. The story is fairly simple, boiling down to Bowser has the princess locked up in his sky castle and has the star rod to grant his wishes, so you have to find the seven star spirits to get up there and fight him. Side note, 
This is one of my favorite Bowser kidnap plots. Uprooting the princess's castle by building another bigger castle underneath is badass. He even does it again in Super Mario Galaxy. The gameplay is simple but fun and engaging. While the usual RPG affair has you pick an action then sit back and watch your avatar do all the hard work, Paper Mario makes you do some of the heavy lifting. Your attacks come with inputs and, if done with the right timing, allows for some extra damage. There are even inputs to guard against enemy attacks and reduce damage. Stats are all very simple, and streamline the game. Enemies have HP, attack, and defense. And that's it. No special attack, no speed, just those three. The combination of the simple gameplay, cartoony graphics, and humorous writing ties this game into a neat little bow. It's a real treat, but it gets better. So take everything good about Paper Mario, then imagine it's even better. That represents part of what makes the Thousand Year Door so freaking good. Disclaimer, funny enough, this is actually my favorite game of all time, so I'm just a little bit biased. I'll try to remain objective, but it is my favorite for a reason. Multiple reasons, actually. So let's get into them. Right off the bat, the story goes ahead and throws us outside the familiar Mushroom Kingdom, and into the scummy pirate Maz Isley of Rogueport, where, it turns out, Peach is missing. But not because of Bowser, there's actually this mysterious underground organization called the x Knots that have her in captivity for some unknown reason. So, Bowser is tossed from main antagonist to a playable side character. Oh, you heard me right. Playable. And damn it, if Bowser isn't the best playable side character in the history of side characters, Ever. Not only is getting to play as the Mario series main antagonist freaking badass, but Bowser is home to arguably some of the best lines of the game. His constant frustrations with his fruitless quest to re-kidnap Peach and him being a punching bag for so many jokes makes him utterly magnificent in this game. And he doesn't overstay his welcome either. You get one dose of him for every chapter of the game to get the perfect amount of the bows. But enough about Bowser, the quality of his writing honestly applies to dozens of characters in the Thousand Year Door, and the shifting of the usual Mario storytelling is fresh and exciting, especially since the game combines it with incompetent techno-Nazis and the Indiana Jones-like mystery of the game's namesake, a giant sealed door that resides in the ruins of a sunken city contained within the sewers of Rogueport and the crystal stars associated with it. Outside of the story and characters, the gameplay is a definitive improvement, with partners in battle being further integrated almost acting as independent characters and not just add-ons to Mario's arsenal. Stylistically, the game's simpler graphics hold up to even the modern day over 15 years later, and the game even indulges in the paper part of Paper Mario by introducing mechanics like a paper tube and boat mode for Mario to fold into like an Italian origami. I believe that the game takes full advantage of its place as a sequel. The original Paper Mario very much dug its feet in established Mario canon, but the Thousand Year Door explores weird new characters and settings that would normally feel out of place. But since the game shares so much DNA with the first Paper Mario, it transitively feels right at home in the greater Mario canon. Furthermore, the charm and heart of this game is through the roof, and I love it dearly. Super Paper Mario has a strange place in my heart. Initially, I actually thought lowly of the game, but after a decade and several reconsiderations and another playthrough, it's a good game, although unorthodox in terms of Paper Mario. Remember how I said the Thousand Year Door managed to fit in the Mario canon through maintaining a sort of consistency? Well, Super Paper Mario kinda cancels itself out. It is still an RPG with level-up mechanics and the like, 
However, it replaces the turn-based battle system with platforming, alienating it from the other two games in the series. You would think that this makes it fit in with the usual Mario platformer. However, since Paper Mario is already out of line with the core Mario titles, this game just ends up feeling like it exists in a vacuum, not really belonging to either Paper Mario or the core Mario games. On top of that, the story is way different than before, barely a Mario story at that. Without getting into spoilers, for a decade old game, the true main characters of the overarching narrative aren't even from the pre-established Mario canon. The whole game is a weird offshoot, both of Mario and Paper Mario. But somehow it kinda works. The gameplay is still fun and satisfying, the writing is still good as always, and the story, a love story at that, is actually engaging, and you care about the characters involved. However, the Thousand Year Door is the definitive superior over this game. Super Paper Mario simply removes a little too much of the usual Paper Mario formula, causing it to fall flat somewhat, as it loses some of that special charm its predecessors had. However, still a solid entry, not bad. What shall we do to fill If you wanted to continue our Star Wars analogy, Stigger Star is the Phantom Menace. I can recall the excitement I felt for this game, and early footage made it look like a return to form from the Thousand Year Door, with turn-based combat and 3D overworlds, and even a partner, maybe multiple. It was all the things I craved from the originals, but then it came out, and it indeed gave us what we wanted, but tainted. One core, integral part of the series was disgraced, no. Mutilated in this game. The greatest atrocity I've ever seen. Bowser does not talk! I'm only half joking, by the way. I was genuinely angry that they gave Bowser no dialogue. He had all the best lines, and they just slapped dinosaur sounds over him. <coughs> Terrible. Anyway, the real core problem here was the gameplay. It was a turn-based RPG, but, you couldn't just, say, jump on an enemy or hammer them. You had to use a sticker. A limited supply of stickers, might I add. A supply of stickers that you had to restock with stickers from the overworld and sticker shops. Where you'd pay money for your stickers. Stickers that if you ran out of them, you could literally do nothing in a battle. NOTHING! Imagine if you had to buy a use of every Thunderbolt in Pokémon or a swing of the Monado in Xenoblade. Imagine if you had to insert a credit card into a gun to use the damn thing. It's ridiculous. Furthermore, bosses were either iron walls, or if you had the right specific sticker, were jokes. So you never actually had to be good at the game to beat a boss. You just had to use whatever near insta-kill sticker they were weak to. Going off of that Bowser thing, the writing in this entry is weak. Which isn't helped by the fact that there's so few NPCs. Previous entries were flooded with people to talk to, of all races and kinds. But Sticker Star has exactly one town, filled only with red toads. And the story? Just the usual Mario affair, but without the writing of Paper Mario or the quality gameplay of the rest of the series. Sticker Star is an abysmal joke of a game. And I'm really only that angry at it because the series it comes from warrants so much more quality.
Color Splash is Revenge of the Sith. It sees the errors of its past and tries to make amends, but it still holds itself back with the same stupid gimmicks. The writing is an absolute improvement, with there being lots more of it and of actual comedic quality. The game looks great too. Now if only the gameplay could hold it up. Oh wait, it's just Sticker Star 2.0 but with ink instead of stickers. And instead of battles being these quick and simple processes, you have to do some gimmick with the gamepad to attack. Eh, better than Sticker Star. The game has some merit thanks to the long awaited return of good writing, but it's still Sticker Star with a new coat of paint. So, what about the future of the franchise? Well, this Game Informer interview with the producer of Color Splash might give us some insight. Wait, what's this about NPCs? Miyamoto asked if they would make a game with only characters from the Mario family? So then they just used Toads, instead of creating original characters. And oh goodness grief, not this schlock. The good old Nintendo thought process of, don't think about the old, think about the new gimmicks we could do. While this philosophy certainly has its place, don't get me wrong, it really went awry in the Wii U era. Let's not forget Star Fox Zero, and Color Splash is no different. To be fair, in recent times, Nintendo has given us less gimmicky and just actually good games. They introduced new mechanics, yes, but they've been done in service of gameplay rather than novelty. Breath of the Wild with its open world, Mario Odyssey with its cappy mechanics, so on and so forth. So, hopefully, Paper Mario will see a brighter future. And that's all that's happened recently in the franchise. There hasn't been any official news. There was a Twitter hashtag and a petition a few months back, which I'm sure really made some sort of change. Simply, there isn't anything to look to for the future at the moment in terms of Paper Mario. So, what made those first few entries as beloved as they are? Well, maybe we should ask, who made those entries so beloved? Alrighty, so let's take a look-see at the casts. Hmm, the writers shifted around a bit. Although the director was Ryota Kawade every time, huh? Well, 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 what's this? A change in directors, hmm? Interesting. Might this explain a change in quality of the last few Paper Marios? Perhaps, although maybe I shouldn't put so much pressure on Aoyama. He has been here since the beginning. No, I think the problem might just lie a little more towards the end of the credits. Yes, that's right. Miyamoto. Now now, I love and appreciate Miyamoto and everything he's created for us in his career, but you can't always trust your heroes, and Miyamoto is no exception. He has a history of pushing his hand a little too hard in Mario titles, a notable example being that he wanted to de-emphasize any sort of story in Super Mario Galaxy 2, because the first one simply had too much story. You know, Rosalina's backstory, which was entirely optional to even view, and actually added a nice layer to the game. I believe the Paper Mario franchise is simply another victim, really. No special dramatic story. It's just a franchise he targets his new and innovative gimmick attitude into, and it's managed to stay around a bit more often and longer than, say, Star Fox or Metroid. Although, I do wonder, would our boy Kawade ever return to directing Paper Mario? Probably not. With all of this talk of Paper Mario's history and future, it's inevitable that one would ask, what makes it stand out? Well, let's go bit by bit. Firstly, it's a Mario game, so there's already an audience for it. However, it is not the only Mario RPG series. There's also the Mario & Luigi series, 
Although I don't see intelligent systems going bankrupt anytime soon, so I guess there's technically only Paper Mario now. But regardless, what makes Paper Mario rise above Mario and Luigi? To be honest, both series have similar appeals. The stories take us into new, exciting, yet familiar places and characters, use button timing within their battles for an engaging experience, and have multitudes of clever writing and sublime humor. Well, I think Paper Mario has its place on home consoles to think. Being on a console as opposed to a handheld makes it a bigger deal in a way, if for nothing more than having nicer music and graphics and being playable on the big screen. Secondly, I think Paper Mario had both a consistent identity and improving quality over the first two installments, solidifying itself. While Mario & Luigi had a great first game, but the sequel was not seen as an absolute improvement by the greater community, and the tone is grittier, losing a sort of tonal through-line in the series, overall making less of an impact as compared to The Thousand Year Door. These factors leave the Paper Mario franchise, especially The Thousand Year Door, as the top dog Mario RPG, thus making it the leader in this strange little subgenre, leading to Mario fans to directly leech from the main general Mario fandom onto the subgenre defined by The Thousand Year Door. And that following is sizable and devoted, mostly, I believe, because these people love to see complex interactions within the Mario universe, since most other titles are Jump on Goomba and Save Princess after 8 worlds. Paper Mario offers the closest thing to a real Mario story that us fans of the Italian plumber can get. And I guess that's why I care about it so much too. These games give us so much insight into the worlds and characters of this sacred franchise in gaming. Not only that, but it manages to stand on its own, elevating both itself and the source material. It's just a shame to see it all fall apart within the past decade. But they can't take away those first three games though, especially the Thousand Year Door. Maybe we'll never ever get another good Paper Mario, or maybe even another Paper Mario at all, but I can always revisit the game that instilled so much wonder in me. Through its sense of adventure, through its lovable cast, through its amazing antagonist, through its wonderful locales, through its engaging gameplay, through its undeniable charm, Paper Mario will always have a place in my heart, even if its golden age is a long time gone. But I suppose that's just what makes this franchise a fleeting beauty.